That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be happy today. Welcome to the Happy Today podcast. I'm Ryan Woods, otherwise known as Lady Maga USA. I am a patriot. I love to dress up. And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, welcome. I'm so excited about our guest. But real quick, I want to tell you about my conservative Latina patriot friend. Her name is Kimberly. She is in... Um, She's in Texas. She's a Latina business owner, and uh, she sells doorbell covers that are adorable. I would recommend the American flag one or the eagle one. You can get these doorbell covers. They would make a great stocking stuffer for Christmas this year or Kwanzaa or whatever you're celebrating. <laughs> and uh, you could just visit waterwood.net, just like it sounds, waterwood.net. And you can support a, an entrepreneurial uh, Latina business owner. Today's show is very exciting to me because our guest is someone that I have met a few times at different rallies. She is notorious. She is famous. She is controversial. Uh, but what I love most about her is she stands her ground. And uh, you may have heard of her. And if you haven't, now you're going to learn all about her. And I hope you fall in love with her because she is an outspoken uh, patriot. So, Carlin Borisenko, welcome to the Happy Today podcast. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, Ryan. Thank you for having me. You bet. And I'm glad you're wearing pink because as we learned from Mean Girls on Wednesdays, we wear pink. Exactly. Right? Just for you yeah. will I wear pink. I usually wear black, so I put it today special for you. I know. You look so pretty. You just got your little pink lipstick on and your, your smudgy, smoky eyes. You look absolutely beautiful, and I appreciate you dressing up. But I do want you to show people what your shirt says. It says, politically homeless. Politically homeless. And um, I know why you have that on your shirt. And we have so much to dive into. But I just want to start for listeners or viewers who might not have heard of you or who might not know your work. Just give us like what you would like the world to know about you. If you just had to stand up and introduce yourself to the world, what would you say? Yeah, so I, I, a, lot, a lot of people uh, found out about me last year when social justice took over my knitting community in 2019. And um, like, I'm a knitter. I've been knitting for 15 years. I knit obsessively. I knit almost every day. And so the knitting community is like, it's my, it's my home. It's where I, it's where I do spend my free time. And so social justice warriors took over my knitting community, started running around, threatening people if they weren't using the right language, destroying businesses, all the usual stuff that we've seen at Gamergate and like, a million other places and I was a Democrat for 20 years and when this happened it kind of like I don't know what what like why specifically this was the moment where I woke up but I it was my red pill moment to see what was going on in the knitting world and these people that were in the same political party as me were just behaving horribly and so that kind of started me on a journey of questioning um, everything I frankly knew was true in the world. And I ended up at a Donald Trump rally in Manchester, New Hampshire, the day before the New Hampshire primary um, back in 2020. And just, it totally blew my mind how different Trump supporters were than what the media had portrayed them as. So I wrote an article about my experience. I put it on Medium thinking no one would ever see it. And a couple of days later, everyone and their mother had retweeted it and Don Jr. had shared it. And it was like Glenn Beck read it on his show and it's like everywhere. And so that was kind of how a lot of people became aware of me. I never really had any intention of doing anything in politics, but as soon as you are very publicly outed in front of 3 million people as leaving the Democratic Party, that kind of presents some challenges um, in your life, let's just say. But it, it all ended up working out for the better. I toured with the walkaway campaign with Brandon Schrock for the, the back half of 2020. We were doing rallies let's all over the go, place. Let's go, Brandon! Let's go, Brandon! We, we, we were at some of those rallies together. They were awesome. They were the best. Brandon is one of the greatest people in the world. And, you know, I've been, I've been kind of just playing in the space ever since. My biggest thing is I'm really actively fighting back against critical race theory, social emotional learning, what's going on in the schools. It really is disgusting what the woke left have done at just every level of society. And so I'm continuing to speak out and fight back, even though it's a little harder now than it was in 2020. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I just commend you for your courage and being honest. Um, I, when I first started, because I'm a drag artist, I was very nervous for my first Trump rally. I had no idea what kind of reception I would get. I had no idea what I was in for. And I got out of that Uber 
just, you know, shaking in my boots. And it was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was inclusive. It was diverse. There were Hispanic people everywhere. It was in New Mexico, black people, um, gay people, you know, we were all there together. And um, I was embraced. I mean, the, oops, there went my light. Sorry. Uh -oh. It's the Little. universe. It's the universe. <laughs> What's the message? The message is you don't oh. have to have perfect lighting. You can, you're beautiful without it. Not really though. <laughs> but anyway, um, sorry for that. It was, it was, as you experienced, it was a very positive vibe. It was very, it, it was just, I cried afterward because I, I was so emotional and it was just a wonderful experience. So I'm glad that you shared the truth with people. Um, talk to me a little bit about what it was like to suddenly be a, you know, a, a, a famous person in the movement, just exploding overnight. What was that like? Well, like you have to understand, like, I really was not involved in politics at all. Like, you know, a lot of people, when, when they see someone like transition away from the left, I think, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that we can point to on the right that say we were former Democrats or recover Democrats, and then they convert to conservative. Like, I had no idea any of this was going on. This was like not a part of my life plan. And so for all of a sudden, and, and the other thing was too, is like, I never really interacted with Republicans or conservatives or any of that. So I, I, it was just a complete culture shock for me to suddenly be surrounded by all these people who knew who I was and knew my story. And I, I went to CPAC a couple of weeks after my article went viral and like, everyone knew who I was. And it was just, it was, it was very weird. Um, you know, and it's still weird for me. Like I, I never had the intention of being a public person at all. And it just kind of worked out that way, but I believe that everything happens for a reason. And one of the things that I learned and I just got, I can't even tell you how many emails and DMS on Twitter and messages and all these things that I got from people saying that my story had inspired them or made them realize that their family members who they had bad relationships with could wake up. And so I kind of thought like, you know, if my story is inspiring to others, there's a reason that this happened. Um, I do believe that my original article was inspired by like a much higher power than, than me. I believe I don't, I, I, I think it came from God through me. I just happened to be the vessel for it for the specific purpose of letting people know that there were people like me and it was possible to wake up and so i just kind of kept rolling with it and you know where can we, we today. where can we find that original article that started the explosion oh you can actually still find it on medium it is still up on medium um so uh, medium.com or medium.com medium if you just google my name um and trump rally or just even carlin and trump rally it's gonna pop right up it was just covered i actually looked it up the other day i had to send it to someone so it'll pop right up <laughs> well that is incredible and you know, um, you and I, I don't think we see eye to eye on a lot of issues. Um, even though I am gay and I'm a drag artist, mm -hmm. I am, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much based, you know, like a, yeah. a lot of times I have more in common sometimes with the more griper crowd than I do mm -hmm. with like the, you know, the crowd that is uh, like sexually explicit in their content and stuff like that sometimes. I, so I had, I sort of had the idea in my mind that, um, you would not be a big believer in God. Talk to me a little bit about your faith. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a, a deeply spiritual person. Now, and a lot of people think I'm an, an atheist. I'm not. A lot, a lot of people think I'm a lesbian, too. I'm not. I'm married to a dude, have been for 10 years. Um, but like, no, I, I, you know, I don't follow a specific organized religion for me. And, and I don't care if people do. Like, what people's business is their business. Like, we have freedom of religion in this country for a reason. It's not my business how people practice and worship. Um, but I don't believe in organized religion. I think that organized religion is mostly about power and control. And of course, like, I mean, like, you know, me leaving the Democratic Party is like breaking free of power and control. So I'm not necessarily a fan of that. But no, I um, I follow spiritual practices, um, a lot of like ancient wisdom that's been around for thousands of years that was around even before Jesus. I've worked with shamans um, in the Amazon. I have all sorts of spiritual teachers. I have a meditation practice um, that I commune with God through meditation um, and things like that. So no, I, I definitely do believe in God. I, I, I've had entire conversations with Jesus. Um, I just happen not to adhere to like the Christian faith specifically. I think that is just uh, very inspiring. Um, I, you know, I put on a happy face when I'm doing my mm -hmm. podcast or especially when I'm Lady Mago USA, but I'm really, really struggling right now. And just last night I was crying in bed and I just was feeling so hopeless. And when you're in those moments, it's funny how you tend to sort of turn to God because there's nothing mm -hmm. else to turn to. We lose our friendships. I lost my job. I lost everything. And so, um, 
I think that's why we are one nation under God. And I feel like the government for the left is, you know, Fauci and all the rest, they are replacing God in these people's hearts because they just, they don't realize that our rights and our, and our power does come from something higher than that. Now I want to join in. Uh, I, I want to talk about, are you kidding me? I just, Oh no, again, again no. Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Oops, you voted Biden. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I got my little cord down here catching my foot. Oh okay. no. Hold on one second. I am so sorry. Look That's at me. That's all good. All, this has never happened before. But everything happens for a reason. So I want to know what the reason is. Yeah. And I really do believe that. I really do believe that like everything happens for a reason. I believe that when we go through struggles in life, whether they're big or small, it sets us up for something larger. Um, and I think that if you it, like, anytime we have a hard time, like if you can just zoom out and say like, this is, there's a purpose to this, you know, we might not like just because we don't like it. It just because things aren't working out the way we thought they would, it doesn't mean there's not a purpose for it. Yeah. But the dark voice inside of me says, oh, that's just wishful thinking. Well, I mean, maybe, but you know, I like, I think that, listen, if we like life is about contrast, right? So if it would we ever be able to really appreciate the awesome things that happen to us in life, if the, if the bad things didn't happen, and maybe an easy analogy for this is like, you know, think of like, ha have you ever like had a water heater break and you have to take a cold shower? Oh yeah. yeah. I lived, I lived overseas in third world countries for nine years of my life. So every yeah. day was a freezing cold shower and um, it did it did make me appreciate it but once you're back in the states you don't appreciate it because you get used to it so you're right without the contrast and the reminders of how good things really mm -hmm. are when you're healthy with your hot water and your food mm -hmm. um yeah that's a good point point. and i do believe things happen for a reason i do have faith but uh you know the darkness does creep in sometimes so speaking of darkness speaking of lies um for for most of the people who listen to my podcast you're probably aware of what critical race theory is, you're probably not familiar with the term social emotional learning, mm -hmm. which in my in my eyes is actually more dangerous than CRT, because um, CRT is pretty obvious and open about their ideas of, you know, uh, anti white rhetoric and equity instead of equality. Mm -hmm. But social emotional learning is actually um, it's, it's a form of brainwashing and it's, it's making teachers psychologists for their students, which is dangerous and inappropriate. And I just uh, saw a video that you had shared of a, a concerned mother, uh, of course, a domestic terrorist, right? These concerned mothers are now domestic terrorists. And she was in a school and she picked up a book. I think it was called Gender Queer or Queer Something. And there was legitimate pornographic drawings in there, including drawings of um adults with minors and i just i i don't know i don't know where we're going in this country but i do know that you that's sort of been your focus um is fighting critical race theory and social emotional learning and this inappropriate agenda that's being pushed please educate us on this yeah. talk about it and tell us um if if and how we can make a difference. So let's start with critical race theory because critical race theory is obviously like the hot button issue of the moment. And it, you know, I, I understand it can be very easy to think that critical race theory is just against white people. The fact of the matter is, is that critical race theory is against everyone. It is a fundamentally just racist ideology. It is, it is racist against white people. It's racist against black people, racist against Asian people, Hispanic people, Native Americans. It is racist against everyone. And the whole point of critical race theory, and this might sound a little counterintuitive, but it's not actually even about race. It is under the umbrella of a larger school of thought called critical theory. And there are a million different types of critical theory. There's critical gender theory. There's qu critical queer studies. There's fat studies. There's disability studies. And by the way, like if you think that critical race theory is crazy like critical race theory has actually had to temper down a lot of its craziness because it's gotten so public lately but like I, I, I watch, I, I spend my time basically like watching these trainings and lectures online from all these things. Critical fat studies is insane. Queer theory is insane. Like, like you think we've hit crazy town yet? Like I went down the whole fat studies rabbit hole a couple of weeks ago. Do they actually call it fat studies? Yes, they really do. Oh, and, oh, so, and, so we could say fat again. It's not, it's not politically oh, incorrect. Oh, you're, you're not only are you allowed to say fat, but fat should be celebrated. And there's all sorts of like fat porn and fat all this other stuff and like the things that my eyes have seen ryan they cannot unsee 
they cannot. And so like, so, you know, the, the point I want to make is this is like, critical theory in general, whether it be about race or gender or sexuality or gender identity or any of these other things, it really, it is not about, it, it is not really about any of these social issues. It is about fundamentally destabilizing the system. It is about fundamentally um, giving the left tools that they can use to cause divisions, to keep us fighting each other. Because like critical race theory is a great example of this because like, it, it, you know, it, it sometimes gets positioned as being against white people. Well, what does that result in? It results in white people fighting black people or fighting Hispanic people because they feel like they need to. And and the the reality is that like anyone who buys into this, like like you're being played by the system. This is exactly what the left wants you to do. They want you to be fighting. They want you to be angry. They want you to feel marginalized. Um, but no one can make you feel inferior without your consent at the end of the day. Um, so critical race theory isn't about race. It's about power. And it really really is once um once people kind of like the one thing people need to wrap their head around is the idea that the the entire goal is to destabilize the system because they cannot build a little marxist utopia until they destabilize the system and in every single training i watch there is one common enemy and it's not white people it's capitalism Capitalism is brought up as the enemy in every single training and some, and it's done covertly. Like sometimes they may only mention it one time in the training, but it always ends up being said where capitalism is racist. Capitalism is the enemy. Capitalism is the thing that needs to go. That's who the real enemy is. Because again, you can't bring in Marxism if you have capitalism, right? But let's talk about social emotional learning because like you, you are 100% correct that social emotional learning is a thousand times scarier than critical race theory. And and before you talk about that, um, yeah. tell us a little bit more about your, excuse me, uh, a little bit more about your background in oh. uh, psycho psychological yeah. studies, Psychology. because your, yeah. your opinion on this is valid because you have actually study yeah. all of this so i have a phd in psychology um my focus is on industrial organizational psychology which is psychology and business and that's actually and i i have a practice that i've had since 2012 of like um i used to do a lot of consulting in organizations i can't really do as much consulting anymore because i get canceled really easily I, I still do stuff but i have to be covert about it um but um no where i first started seeing this stuff was in organizations it was in people reporting microaggressions to hr like if they weren't CC'd on an email and they were black, microaggression. If they weren't invited to a meeting and they were black, microaggression. Microaggression is basically anything that anyone might find offensive um, that they can then say this is a result of unconscious bias and then they have to bring in anti-racism, all this stuff. Anyway, um, but you know, to the point about social emotional learning, social emotional learning is directly related to psychology. Now, one of the things I did a lot of work with when I was doing my graduate studies was around groupthink. Essentially, how do we how how do we people get sucked into groupthink cult like ideologies? <clears throat> and it's really really easy when you're talking about introducing aspects to children before they're eight years old. So I typically worked with adults up until this point. I never had any desire to work with kids, but the fact of the matter is um, the left is now specifically targeting children as young as three or four years old. The Arizona Department of Education says that children start to become racist around the age of three years old. And so the earlier that the left gets to these kids in schools, the worse it's gonna be and the harder it is to change. So social emotional learning kind of starts off with just how can we how they like to position it is how can we just have empathy for people who are different than us and and so what they do is they might they might ask the children to say where do you fall on the gender identity spectrum are you more a boy or are you more a girl now when you're talking about five six seven year olds they have no idea they have no idea they have no idea what it means to be a boy or what it means to be a girl but and I, i'm not going to say there's not like like extremely rare cases where a child like might legitimately like you know i i do believe like trans trans people being trans is a real thing right um and i want to acknowledge that and i do believe that that some children know that they are born into the wrong body very early on and you know that's something that has to be managed but what they're trying to do when they're asking every single child in the classroom to say where do you fall on the gender identity spectrum is they're grooming these children from a very early age to not believe they're born into the right body. 
And then regardless of they are, or regardless of they aren't, it's like, it's like you've set them up to be in this constant battle to, to be questioning who they are from the very beginning. The reality is that yes, trans people exist, but they are an extremely small percentage of the population. It is extremely small. Not anymore. Not anymore, honey. Their, oh their recruitment God. efforts. Um, my niece is actually a, a psych, psychologist and she said it's an epidemic and my my uh, nephew he is a church leader with his youth group half of them are buying into this ideology so i want to unpack a couple of ideas that you presented here um yeah thank you for pointing out that critical race theory is racist toward all people not just white people because i feel like as you said, they want the white people to feel threatened. They love the fight. They want to create division. I did yeah. a podcast with a beautiful black girl who shared her story with me. And she gave the analogy that really kind of applies to what you're saying. So when you put red ants and black ants in a jar, mm -hmm. they get along. If, if you do it quietly and calmly, they just kind of mingle and then they separate a little and, you know, they're in their little ant world. But if you shake that jar, they will fight one another to the death. So what you're saying is it's about power and we have to look at who is shaking the jar and not get so caught up in the day to day uh, white versus black conservative yeah. versus black lives matter, because that that is their goal. And it's hard to remember that it's really, really hard to remember that as a conservative. But I I want everyone to remember remember, uh, Carlin has studied this and we have to ask who is shaking the jar and what the ultimate goal is. And it's to destabilize society, create division, ultimately take down capitalism and usher in what I would call the new world order, the great reset. They're not even hiding it anymore. No, no, they're not. No. And that's, that's exactly right. And, and we always have to kind of zoom out and say like, who has, who is gaining an advantage every time we are fighting each other. Right. And so people have to, and I know this is hard because I know there's a lot of different information. It's coming from a lot of different places, but to be frank, like conservative influencers really suck at explaining this to people. They, they're really, really bad at it. Um, so I would recommend people look at someone like James Lindsay, look at someone like Chris Rufo. You can come on my YouTube channel. I explain this all the time because it really, people need to zoom out and see the bigger picture. Okay, what is your on. YouTube channel? Because I would love for yeah. people. Uh, what it's, is it? It's just my name, Carlin Borisenko. So if you, I, I guarantee you, I'm the only Carlin Borisenko on YouTube. So. On YouTube. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. you unpack this for people on YouTube. Um, yeah. I've been involved with uh, Senator John Johnson here in Utah. He's sort of the number one outspoken person about critical race theory. And like, like you, he unpacks it in a, in a realistic way. Um, but after listening to you, I'm going to be more careful when I talk about this stuff, because we have to realize who the true enemy is. It's not the good hearted people who want us all to get along. It is the well, primarily the Democrats and the people on the left who who have a bigger vision and their vision is division and um, and, and getting us out of that. So back to social emotional learning and yes. the issue of gender. Um, I'm very passionate about individualism and being who you are, no matter what. And that is why I refuse to not be Lady Maga USA, because I love to dress up. I am a theatrical person. I'm not a sexual figure. I don't have an agenda. And a lot of people, you know, tell well, of course, on the left, they tell me I'm a Nazi and, you know, cancel my events and everything else. But on the right, they kind of say you would be more effective if you if you don't do this as Lady Maga USA, if you just go forward as you and and, and inside my patriot heart, I'm like, no, this is America. I'm going to do what makes me happy. But as yeah. someone who loves so-called women's clothing and makeup and hair, I could have been one of these vulnerable children today that oh, they yeah. are manipulating and brainwashing. And to me, there is nothing. I mean, OK, the trans issue. I have trans friends as well. Love them. They're adults. I, you know, be you. And they do say that I felt like I was in the wrong body from the time I was little. Um, that being said, telling a regular child, whether they're straight or gay, that you are in the wrong body to me is emotional abuse because nothing could be more scary than to believe everything about me is wrong. My genitalia is bad. Everything is, is different. And I believe that's why these, the, the transgender suicides among young people are so high because fundamentally they've been conditioned to believe that there's something intrinsically wrong with their very body. So I feel like um, 
telling children, you, you know, to choose their gender on the spectrum is actually uh, really harmful. And you've, you've explored that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot and I strongly believe that if I was in school today, like I'm old, right. I, I went to school a long time ago. If I was in school today, I absolutely would have thought I was trans. 100%. I all, I, I was, I, I mean, I'm sure you can't tell by looking at me. I, I'm, I'm a tomboy. I, I've always been more comfortable around men. I, all, I, I wanted to be a boy so badly growing up because I like playing all the boys sports. That was who I wanted to hang out with. And I guarantee that if, if I was in school today and they had introduced this idea to me of like, you can be any gender you want. Like I, I absolutely would have said, I want to be a boy. I want to be a boy. It would have been every day with my parents. And the thing about what's going on in the schools is the schools aren't even telling the parents when the kids are doing this stuff. And they aren't even telling them. Sometimes they aren't even telling them when they go on hormones or they go on puberty blockers or any of these things. Well, because yeah. their parents are domestic terrorists, Carlin, you know that. Oh and God. as we've been told, um, the parents should not be telling educators what to teach in the schools, right? right. No, so yeah, it's... they're they're actually hiding the the um, the conversations that they're having with vulnerable underage children regarding their genitalia, regarding their gender, regarding their bodies, and excluding parents from those conversations. And that that is extremely dangerous. And, and one of the scariest things is we like social emotional learning is literally teachers practicing psychology without a license. Like I, I have a literal PhD in psychology and I am not allowed to do what these teachers are doing because I'm not a clinician. I never trained to be a clinician or a counselor or any of that. I'm not allowed to do what these teachers with no training, no education, no background in psychology are doing to these children. And it's resulting in children having surgeries before they're even old enough to vote. That to me is crazy. I have no problem with people socially transitioning, cut your hair, wear different clothes, go by different, like who, who really cares? But like, like when you're talking about children going on puberty blockers that could potentially leave them infertile later in life, when you're talking about children having surgery before they are able to vote or buy cigarettes or buy alcohol or join the army or any of that. Or get a I tattoo or they or can't get, get their tattoo. ears pierced without right. uh, parental consent, but they can be injected with, with drugs. When these young people um, are told that puberty blockers are simple, and I get angry messages from parents of trans kids a lot. They say, no, you're so misinformed on puberty blockers. Um, no, I'm not. And I'm sure you've also uh, researched mm -hmm. uh, the idea of puberty blockers. Talk to me about what you've learned about that specific issue. I mean, I wouldn't say I've like spent a ton of time researching that, but I mean, ge just generally speaking, like I do not believe that children should be medically transitioning before they reach the age of 18. Everything that I've seen says that, you know, when, when children, when, when trans people transition as adults, the recidivism rate is extremely low. I mean, as you said, they, they know that they were born into the wrong body when they were kids. They make the choice when they're adults. They don't, most of them don't look back. But when, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as my understanding, the recidivism rate as, 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 when children transition before they're 18 is extremely high. And so I guess like my perspective, why don't we want to make sure those kids are in therapy with actual therapists for, for, you know, a year, maybe two years. I think the, the normal rate used to be like two years. They'd have to be in therapy before they started any sort of medical transition, help them to talk it through. Like there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with talking about what you're feeling and trying to work that out and trying different things and making absolutely sure that before you make a life altering medical decision, that you're 100% sure that it is the right thing to do. There is nothing wrong with being in therapy. There's nothing wrong with waiting. I mean, these kids have their whole lives ahead of them. And I just, these some of these detransition stories, they just make me so sad because it was so completely unnecessary. And the detransitioners are cut off. They are shadow banned. They are labeled as transphobic. Um, I spoke with Buck Angel. Do you follow Buck Angel? I love Buck Angel. Oh, I so love much. him so much, Trandpa. He's just he's just such a courageous person, and he he talked about affirmative therapy, where um, psychologists and psychiatrists must affirm uh, the child's gender identity immediately, and they cannot question it. So, someone like me, who's an adult, I'm perfectly happy in my biological body. I'm very grateful. Um, a child like me. I, I would have done the exact same thing as you said, as a kid, because I hung out with the girls. I would, I would dress up in my sister's prom dresses when nobody was home. I was totally into, you know, so-called girl things and all of those activities are essentially harmless. 
but I definitely, if this ideology and social emotional learning and CRT was what was fed into my brain every day, I would have been convinced that I was in fact a girl, not just a biological boy who's a little different. So affirmative therapy is becoming law where uh, you know, a psychologist and a psychiatrist actually is not allowed to question the so-called gender identity of a child. So even if they get put in therapy um, in today's climate, it's not so bad in the USA, but in Canada and other places, it's actually becoming illegal to tell a nine-year-old boy wearing a dress that, hey, maybe you just like dresses. Yeah. And, and why is that? Why are we so afraid that nine-year-old boys might just like wearing dresses? They might just like pretty things or, or that young girls might just like playing baseball. They might just like playing football. Like there's no, you know, one of the things that bothers me, when I first started my red pill journey, it was funny. I watched this um, talk from the heritage foundation and there was a lesbian on the panel who was like, I never thought I'd speak at the heritage foundation, but then she explained that because I don't conform to a, a traditionally feminine stereotype that I'm considered queer. And that was news to me. I'm like, I've been straight my entire life. And now you're telling me I'm queer because I, I'm not like, like a girly girl. This is absolutely insane. There's no right way to be a girl. There's no right way to be a boy. And I think I mean, what the woke are doing is they're actually reinforcing these stereotypes. Like these stereotypes don't have to exist. And when I was growing up, it was like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't adopt stereotypes. Like stereotypes mean you're making broad generalizations about people based on, based on things that they can't control. But what the woke are doing is they reinforce stereotypes. They say, this is, this is the way to be black. This is the way to be a woman. This is the way to be gay. This is the way to be trans. And it's just not true. Absolutely. And um, the the radical push for all of this is actually creating more homophobia and more hatred of gay people. I mean, the hatred that I get on the right is not because of what I've done. And it, honestly, 10 years ago, they wouldn't care. But because of the predatory nature of these movements, putting pornographic material into classrooms, which really is happening, and brainwashing the kids like this, it makes it creates more homophobia. But as you have explained, that is the goal. That, that is the goal. Absolutely. So I was going to yeah, go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's really sad with the right because, you know, I, I had a completely different experience with the right before the election than after the election. And I'm not going to say it was like, you know, there's there were always those elements on the right. But, you know, before the election, it was inclusive. Everyone was welcoming. It was talking about like freedom all the time. I mean, I toured with Walkaway. Like Walkaway has like a lot of gay people involved with oh, it. Oh, I love Walkaway. And I'm really hoping yeah. they're just going to launch a gigantic comeback. I, let's, I think let's go, are. Brandon, because I yes. love that man. Oh, he's just so great and courageous. And what happened to him is just uh, it's terrible. And the, the people who drop like flies, too. That really bugs me. It's oh, like, Oops, yeah. He's in trouble with the feds. Can't retweet. Can't defend him. Oh, yeah. he's you know, it's pretty crazy. I, I stick by the patriots who have <laughs> who have fought, you know, Brandon Strzok is an absolute hero. He didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I'm I'm I am absolutely positive of that. I think what's happened to him is absolutely disgusting. But I look at someone like you and like when you go, you're in an event, like you bring such light and fun and joy to the event. It's like always like, you know, I, I remember like you actually on January 6th, Six, we ran into each other on the middle in the middle of the street and it was like oh my god it was just like such a nice moment and um and, and that was before all the stuff went down that I, was before I know we, we knew what was going we were on. we were super far away uh, <laughs> like from the, away. Yeah. the capital I never ended up um at the capital I was on my way I had no idea what was going on I wasn't checking my yeah. phone I didn't find out what happened until late that night when I got back to my hotel and can I tell you the scariest story and sure. this okay, my faith in God, actually, I can never let go of it because of this. So I get back to my hotel and I'm in the lobby. And when I'm Lady Maga, people are always, you know, pictures and fun and talking. And I was, um, I guess who I saw outside of my hotel on the street, Who? the guy with no shirt on with the horns. What's no his name? Kidding. Yeah, he was out there. No kidding. And I had not seen my phone. I had been so busy twirling and dancing with the unity bridge and, and Mindy Robinson and Ricky rebel. Ah. I, that I had no idea what had happened. And I beeline to go get a picture with him because hello, he's sexy and he looked so cool. And uh, people came out of the bar and were like, Lady Maga. And they took pictures with me. And when I went to go get a picture with him, he was no longer there. Do oh, you realize God. what would have happened to me if I had taken that photo? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Thank God that. Well, you know, what's funny. He was actually at a walkaway rally in Arizona. 
And so I knew who he was. And so all these people started saying like, he's, he's a plant. He's a leftist. Like, I know, like, no, that guy just like, that guy's just crazy. Like he just goes to, he goes to rallies and things. And that was his thing. But, you know, I mean, I think like, you know, getting back to like, you know, I think that the right should be more accepting of people like you and, and, and the, and the, the LGBT people who don't buy into all of this radical agenda, because most of them really don't. You just want to live your lives and do what you want to do. And I think it's so sad sometimes because, you know, freedom means freedom to live your life the way you want to live it. And I don't need to agree with anyone's decision about how to live their lives to celebrate how they want to live it and do what they want to do and be happy at the end of the day. And I think sometimes, you know, especially since the election, the right has become, a, frankly, a little authoritarian in this regard. And I understand why, because they're afraid of what's going on with the left taking over and controlling absolutely everything. And this is a natural backlash, right? When the left gets so extreme, that means there's going to be a natural backlash to it. But I just wish people would stop and pause and understand that it's better to make allies than it is to make enemies. And elections are won by getting votes. And one of my greatest fears, to be honest, is I think that the right's losing a lot of votes right now. I think they're losing a lot of people. That they're, they, they lost me, I'll be honest. Like I've been attacked ad nauseum by the right since the election. And I think, and I think, what, what, what reasons bad. are they, why are they attacking you? Um, oh, the Groypers hate me. Oh my God. The Groypers hate me. Now for, um, for people who don't know, the Groypers is a, um, it's essentially a fringe movement within the, the, the right-wing community. They are just extremely, extremely loud. And, uh, they claim to represent the conservative movement, but they, 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 in fact, do not. 99% of conservatives really do believe in freedom as you and I see it. They don't want our choices shoved in their face. They don't want their kids brainwashed. But at the end of the day, they do believe in fundamental, like here in Utah, all my friends are Mormons, love the Mormons. I don't care what they believe about homosexuality. I defend their university's right to have their religious policies and standards even when it comes to homosexuality so i they do respect me i respect them we get along but the groypers do not i think that they are just as bad as the left and they would legislate yes. their morality and their religious views into law and that's that's un-american i mean study thomas jefferson a little bit that's un-american and, and that's exactly right. Like freedom of religion, like it, it protects my right to believe whatever I want as much as it protects your right to believe whatever you want. It doesn't matter how wacky my beliefs are, because frankly, like Christians believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. I don't believe that a virgin can get pregnant. So that's like a whole, if you believe that, fine, you're allowed to believe weird stuff. I'm allowed to believe weird stuff too. But I think that there is this movement, and I think they're gaining a lot more steam than people think of the conservative Christians that do want to legislate their religion and they do want to legislate their morality and for me that's that is no different than the woke left legislating their religion and their morality because i do believe that what the left is doing it is a religion it might not be a religion that centers around god but it, it acts like in the same cult-like manner and so whether it's on the right or whether it's on the left um i believe that people should be able to live their lives how they want to live um now a lot of people thought because of my story and again i understand why because a lot of people when they gain prominence uh, you know in, in on the right it's because like people like me anyway it's like because they're converted from the left like i never really converted from the left. I've always been a liberal. I've always said I was a liberal. Um, I've always been very upfront. I have never labeled myself a conservative. It's not that we can't align on some things. Like I think we well, align on well, liberalism of, religion. Well, liberalism of the past is essentially very conservative today, if that makes yes. any sense. Well, it is like liberal means liberty at the end of the day. And I, I refuse to let go of this. I mean, because because I'm, I'm using the dictionary definition of the word and everyone else has changed the definition. I refuse to change the definition. But I think it got hard for me on the right because, I mean, quite frankly, there were beliefs that I just didn't talk about during 2020. For, for instance, I am pro-choice. I, I, I believe in limits. I don't, I believe the left has gone way too far in regards to abortion. I believe that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, but I am pro-choice. Now, during 2020, when I was trying to get people to leave the Democratic Party and to vote for Trump, and that was kind of my goal, did I talk about being pro-choice every day? No, because it was not the most important issue at the time. But, you know, after the election, when I was able to kind of like basically start saying more of what I wanted to say. Like, frankly, that that 
made people on the right mad because they thought they had converted me. They thought they had won one. And so they'll, they'll attack me for that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think that we should all come together around the things that are most important, like all this fighting over, you know, all these purity tests that are going on. I don't care if, if people agree with me or not. I just want people to, you know, defend freedom of speech, defend freedom of religion, um, you know, defend the Second Amendment, defend, like there's so many battles that we need to fight. And when we're focused on fighting each other, we aren't focused on the things that matter. I agree with you. I, I think at this point, because you and I are not going to see eye to eye on the, the, the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. That being said, without our fundamental constitutional rights to free speech, we will be unable to have that debate in the future, right. if that makes sense. Right. So right now, I, I try to tell people, I don't care if you don't like that I'm a drag queen. I don't care that if you don't like that Carlin is uh, pro-choice. We have to come together for the fundamentals right now, because without those fundamentals, nobody can debate anything in the future. And um, even you, as a you know, s sort of liberal, kind of not your cookie cutter, uh, right wing conservative. Um, I went to your Twitter and I saw that you oh, had no. 80,000 followers, no. 80,100 followers. And the majority, no, but listen, the majority of your tweets, um, you know, 125 likes, 400 likes, 23 likes, 50 likes. It is so obvious to me when someone like you explodes on the scene and you get all of these followers and then your tweets do not get any sort of attention that represents that following you are clearly shadow banned so it's kind of oh, like yeah. you're stuck in a rock and a hard place because people on the right are saying get out you're not a real conservative uh and and the people on the left are clearly censoring you on mainstream media so i commend you for for not giving up and and um keeping up this fight so as someone who clearly does not fit the mold and who you know identifies as a liberal and a, a, a freedom thinker are you um where do you align political party wise like where where do you find yeah. yourself so I was a Republican for about 15 minutes. I tell people I had a one night stand with the Republican party. And then I woke up the next morning and just realized it was, it was a bad idea. It's not, it's not, it's me. It's not you. It was just a bad idea. Not that we can't still be friends. Um, but I ended up um, joining the Libertarian party and specifically the Mises caucus because the Libertarian party is awful. Let's just be blunt. Like the Libertarian party is awful. They why are they awful? They, tell me, tell they, me, why they, are they awful? There's so much infighting and there's so many SJWs in the Libertarian party. And it's just like, and it, it, like the people that run it are just insane but there is one shining beacon of hope in the libertarian party and that is the mises caucus which within the libertarian party there are all these different caucuses that form and and you know there's groups that people align with and so the mises caucus is slowly but surely taking over the libertarian party and i do believe that next mises, year spell it for me so people can look yeah, it up m-i-s-e-s and M-I-S-E-S -S, libertarian and they can find the website and learn about that because I have not heard yeah. about that. Yeah, so they, they can find the website. It's takehumanaction.com. And the Mises Caucus has a simple like eight point platform. And actually how I got involved is the Mises Caucus in New Hampshire. The guys, um, they took me and my husband out for a beer and a really large pretzel and they gave me a pamphlet and they said, here is our platform, which by the way, the Republican Party can learn from this because I was trying to figure out what the Republican Party platform was for like all of 2020 and no one can tell me. The Mises Caucus shows up, hands me a pamphlet with eight points and their points are around private property and no identity politics and, you know, ending the drug war and abolishing the Fed. And I'm like, these are all ideas I can totally 100% get behind. And there are some issues that they don't take a stance on. Like they don't take a stance on abortion because they say there are good people that are on both sides of the issue. That is not the most important thing to us right now. So we're not going to take a stance or open borders. Like a lot of people think that all libertarians are open borders. That's not true. There are people on both sides of the issue and the Mises caucus just doesn't take a stand on it because there are more important things to talk about right now and so i, got I don't know i don't know can i play devil's advocate i don't think there's much more uh stuff that's in, more important than the open border situation why wouldn't they touch oh, that issue 
I think there are plenty more important things in the open border situation. I think that, I think that, you know, we're talking about rampant censorship going on. We're talking about vaccine. The vaccine mandates are honestly like the biggest issue that I think are, is at stake right now, because I think if we lose on the vaccine mandates, I think we lose on all future issues. Oh, honey, um, this is the hill to die on. I'm sorry. Yeah. For me, masks actually were because it's your body, your choice, your ability to breathe the free air. You had COVID, you have antibodies and forcing masks, especially on children to me was already terrifying. And now with the vaccine mandates, I agree with you. Tell me, um, I have my own personal theories, but if we completely lose the battle against vaccine mandates, in your eyes, what could be next? If we lose the battle against vaccine mandates, we're going to become Australia. That's what it is. We are like, and, and I really do believe we are on the road to um, to secession in this country. I believe we are on the road to um, states actually taking it upon themselves. Um, actually, in New Hampshire, which is where I live, there is a bill right now in the New Hampshire House that is a bill for secession. And we don't think it'll pass this year, but give it like five years, I think we are absolutely going down that road. Um, so yeah, no, I-, I New I, Hampshire, live free or die. Live free or die. Oh my gosh, yeah. I lived in Boston for four years uh, when I was a flight attendant before the airline uh, fired me for taking pictures with guns. But uh, I went to the White Mountains. I went camping up there. Yes. Oh, and Indian Head, you know? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that little, that little, um, it's like a resort where they have, it's by Indian Head. It's mm -hmm. like old school gift shop with little like cheesy oh, souvenirs yeah. and stuff. I love New Hampshire. But my favorite thing about New Hampshire is the live free or die license place, which they'll probably get rid of because it's basically, you know, a little too a little too conservative for the leftists well, no i mean the thing of it is is new hampshire like the gop has actually lied quite a bit about this new hampshire is a libertarian state new hampshire is not a blue state new hampshire is actually completely controlled well by the republicans right now but the republicans control our house the republicans control our senate the republicans in theory chris sununu is not is a rhino at best um control the governorship but what a lot of people don't know is that in new hampshire a lot of people who are registered as republican are actually libertarian um we're the home of the free state project, which is, you know, basically they're trying to get as many libertarians as possible to move to New Hampshire so that we can gain political power. Um, and, the, and, and the libertarians do actually have a lot of power here. A quarter of our House of Representative are libertarians or liberty Republicans. And so we are kind of like an oasis in the midst of a whole bunch of blue. I think that's fascinating because the only reason I identify as a Republican, and it's probably the oldest argument in the book, but um, I, I want to be effective. And I feel like the only way to be effective is to be a Republican. But quite frankly, even on issues like the border, which is especially important to me, they're failing us. It's all talk, talk, talk. I swear, Carlin, I swear these Republican leaders behind the scenes are high-fiving the Democrats pushing the elitist agenda to keep us divided, keep us fighting, talk, 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 like Mitt Romney or Mitch McConnell or whoever it is. And then behind the scenes, they're kicking it back and just saying, ah, oh, we're we the elite. We will be protected no matter what. Our interests will be untouched. And the stupid proles are out there fighting each other. Do you feel like that's a reality? I 100% agree with you. And this is part of the reason why I say I had a one night stand with the Republican Party, because I think that the Republican leadership are completely feckless. The GOP is useless. No one does anything. And the fact like the, the GOP won't even reach out to people like Scott Pressler, who has uh, done probably done more to register Republican voters than any other person in this country. The GOP won't even talk to him. Or but to I've, I've seen him. Like, I've Right. I've, or me. Or me. You, I've spent right? two and a half years yeah. busting my butt for this movement. Um, but um, actually, that's not true. The GOP on local levels, um, party leaders have kind of reached out, but not in a big way. So with Scott Pressler, I right. saw him get the Reagan Award at a big event. He has been he recognized. Has. But officially, you're telling me that Scott Pressler has never been. What do you mean by that? He's never been. Scott Pressler should be. And, and listen, I, I like stuff may have happened that I don't know about. So I'm not like, I don't talk to Scott every day. So I don't right. know. I love but him the, though, by the but, way, I love oh, him. He is, he is the best, but I'm sorry, Scott Pressler should have been on the GOP's payroll. Why wasn't he on the GOP's payroll? Why wasn't he on the Trump campaign's payroll? Why wasn't Scott Pressler a speaker at the RNC? And yes, I understand that he was recognized at CPAC. And I thought that that was wonderful. And I was so happy for him. But CPAC but is totally different than the GOP. Not the same thing. And so I, you know, I really, I take a lot of issues with Republican leadership. I think that they haven't done anything to fight back. And, and it's like, I understand like people might say like, oh, they're not in power. What can they really do? 
they can hold press conferences. They can still make statements. They can tweet out words of support. There's so much stuff that they can do just to, to like, you know, even just spread a message that they just simply aren't doing. And I just think it's absolutely disgusting. And so one of the reasons that I ended up leaving um, and joining the Libertarians is that my vote in the Libertarian Party actually does matter. My vote as part of the Mises Caucus within the Libertarian Party does matter because it can change the shape of what the Libertarian Party is doing. It can change the shape of who the Libertarian Party's presidential candidate will be in 2024. And I frankly think that the Republicans are in for a surprise. I think they're going to have a lot of trouble. And it's not as though, listen, I'm not under any illusion that the Libertarians are going to win. They're not going to win. But can they shave off enough support from Republicans so that Republicans will never win again? They absolutely can. And I think that if people aren't paying attention, like like they're going to be in for a surprise. Oh, my goodness. It's also scary because um, at the end of the day right now, I don't even know why people would run for office because I don't trust our election system. Do you? Um. Uh, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, I, 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 obviously there are questions that need to be answered. I haven't really been following the election integrity stuff all that much, but again, I think that this is another example of the GOP being absolutely, sorry, useless. Useless. Like they, complete. I agree with you. Completely useless. They don't talk about it. They, don't do they the, everything they tweet about is just such, it's so general. It's just like such common sense stuff that they're tweeting and, and making it look like they're engaged in the battle, but no. Um, at the end of the day, it's up to people like you and me. It truly is. Um, here in Utah, uh, for example, talk about rhinos. So they had a bill uh, in, in the House to protect women's sports, which is a no-brainer. I'm sorry, a biological woman deserves her own space. This Absolutely. is a group that deserves her own safe space, to use their terminology. So there was a bill to protect women's sports. There was also a bill to protect minors from hormone injections, which are not reversible, by the way, they're not. They, um, if, if you're nine years old and you take hormone injections that stunt your growth, your height, your Adam's apple, your testicular development, when you're 17 and you go off of those, you are not right back where you started when you were 10. So, so I researched that me and transgender people and LGBT conservatives, we went to the state capitol, we testified, we made videos, and it was also to prevent minors from getting surgery. Guess who did nothing and blocked the passing of those bills? Guess who? GOP. GOP. Yep. Spencer Cox, our Mormon Republican governor. So that I agree with you. They are just completely yeah. useless. And, and we have to call them out. The same thing happened in New Hampshire. With, with uh, So I was working on trying to get an anti-critical race theory bill passed in New Hampshire. And again, remember, New Hampshire has a Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican governor. The bill was introduced by a Liberty Republican, a Libertarian, essentially. Um, it, it, had, it, 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 it should have been smooth sailing. It wasn't even going to be an issue, except for Chris Sununu, our rhino Republican governor, worked with the Democrats to completely water down the bill, sent his cronies to do his dirty work for him and the bill got the bill is completely useless like it did it ultimately did pass but it passed in a version that is not going to take critical race theory out of schools it's still being taught in schools in new hampshire and the gop is running around lying about it yep i agree that was the other thing on capitol hill when i was in the meetings with legislators discussing this because they were excited you know i went with the log cabin republicans i'm president of that here in utah great organization by the way most of them are liberty-minded republicans you know like david yes. leatherwood and and uh you know uh rick Grinnell. these are not wishy-washy rhinos um you, your eyebrow raised you think rick and rick Grinnell? no i love rick Grinnell. Oh, okay okay, okay good no, i was no, like no, oh, no. oh, oh. In, in a good way in a good way i yeah, like i like no, I, I, love lo him. I love the log cabin republicans yes but we we went to um in these meetings they actually were talking about how to you know water down the bill to a mm -hmm. point where it was essentially pointless and we went with medical professionals talking about the impact of all of this. And they just kept saying, water it down, water it down. And it was me and other people in the meeting saying, no, you do not water this down. You take yeah. a stand, but yeah. nope, do it anything. didn't pass, but we're going back into the legislative session here in Utah to um, 
to stand up for it again. And hopefully this time they'll listen. Maybe it's because I went dressed as me. Maybe I need to walk in as Lady Maga to draw a little more attention, you know, because that's one of the reasons I do it. (laughs) But I'll, but I'll be honest. And like my position on this is not popular on the, on the right, but I think that Republicans need to stop voting for these people when they do this stuff. Like they need to learn a lesson. Like the GOP is never going to change if they know that GOP voters will just show up and vote for them anyway. And, you know, I understand that it's not a fun thing to lose. And we think, you know, it's giving the left more power but at the end of the day i would much rather we lose in 2022 than lose in 2024 and i really do think that the gop needs a swift kick in the backside if we are going to win in 2024 and i just don't see it happening until people stop voting for horrible candidates right when you say 2024 who do you have in mind as a presidential candidate that you would support Oh, I'm probably going to support Dave Smith and the Libertarian Party, but I, you know, I think Trump's going to run again. I do. I think he's going to run again. Um, What I, what I suspect is going to happen is it's going to be Trump DeSantis. I did hear that Trump changed his residence. Trump still lives in Florida, but like he changed his official residency to New Jersey, um, which to me, like the president and the VP cannot be in the same state. So that would, that might be why that happened. Um, I think it's going to be Trump DeSantis, um, which I think is going to be entertaining. If nothing else, it'll be entertaining. You know, I'll, I'll jump on board i'll jump on board again because i spent you know two years uh as lady maga i still wear my make america great again hat just because of the energy that you described at those rallies and what it stood for when it started i agree that we've become more divided and uh there isn't that sense of unity and freedom but you know what trump is not anti-gay he's not anti-you he sees us as americans so maybe if he does run maybe we'll be able to get back to that place of um unity within the conservative movement my only bone to pick with him is he's not talking about the vaccine mandates Mm -hmm. gives a little tiny comment in his speeches and to me as you have said that is the most important thing more important than the border i agree with you because our bodily autonomy um, when it comes to medical decisions, if, if that's gone, then uh, what a barcode on your forehead, social uh, credit scores, mandatory track. I agree. Australia, we just have to look at Australia and talk about that. So really quick before we wrap up, um, mm-hmm. tell me about your knitting. You're oh. such a knitting nerd and I love it. Show us uh, something. Yeah. I see all this beautiful actually, stuff behind you. I have. This is what I'm working on right now. This is a this is a scarf. Cozy, cozy for fall. And it's like this cool little pattern. And it looks fuzzy. Is it like super soft and fuzzy? It's, it's not. It's very cozy. It definitely is very cozy. So yeah, I have all my knitting. This is probably this one right here. Oh, it's stuck. This one right here is like my 80s shawl. So it's like totally neon. Oh, it's I love it. It's a shape and it's like nine feet long. And so there's, there's that How one. How long does it take you to do this? This took me probably a couple of weeks. This was a, this was a quick one. Um, a couple of weeks. A That's couple quick. Weeks. Yes. In, 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 in the land of knitting, that is very quick. Um, I have this one. Oh, it's beautiful. This is called the star flake. So yeah. I love so that it. kind of goes around you like a wrap. Exactly. Oh my gosh. I really love that. Do you sell these? Can people buy them? No, I knit for fun. Sometimes I'll give them away in like a raffle or something, but I feel like if, 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 like, I don't want knitting to be a job. Knitting is how I relax. I make pretty things, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. You know what? I honestly want to learn to do that because whenever you watch old time movies, you see people calmly sitting in the 1800s and just like meditating while they, uh, while they knit, I'm guessing you kind of go into a meditative state when you are knitting, it takes you to a different place, right? It does. Like, I don't even have to look at my knitting anymore when I'm, cause I've, but I've been doing it for a really long time. I think it takes a while and a lot of knitting to get up to that point, but yeah, I don't even have to look at it. I like having something in my hands and you know, honestly, it's, I, I really think like I never got COVID. I traveled through all of 20. I don't think I got it anyway, but I think like the, one of the reasons I think I never got COVID is because I knit so much. Like my hands are always busy. I'm not touching my face. I have a lot of, I'm very dexterous. I have a lot of control over my hands. And so maybe it helped with that too. Yeah. But by the way, if you do get it, don't worry. You're healthy, you're young, you're beautiful. And then you'll just get antibodies. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm I'm kind of like, like everyone around me has gotten COVID. I'm like, why can't I just get get it already? I want to get it over with. Right. That's kind of like, I tweeted about the chicken pox when you were a kid you know, people were glad when you got the chicken pox because it's itchy. It's bad. Drink some soup. It's over. Now you don't have to worry about it. That's how I really, really feel about COVID. So um, where can people follow you? Where can people financially support you? How can we find you and join the Carlin party? 
Yeah, so the best the best place to go is drcarlin.com, D-R-K-A-R-L-Y-N.com. Um, and that'll have all my social media and all the different places you can find me. But my main two platforms are, I am on Twitter. I'm Dr. Carlin B on Twitter. I'm on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel where I post content very often about all these issues. Um, but my favorite platform is Locals, which is kb.locals.com, which is Dave Rubin's platform. And it's like, it's all about... Um, free expression you're never going to be censored and it's like it's not a hellscape like twitter like twitter is the op- most awful place on the internet but i, ag- I agree is- I-, I was kicked off of instagram with fifteen thousand followers no! and I- oh it was yeah it's devastating it really it really was devastating oh, oh, i can only imagine what it felt like for brandon strock on facebook oh, to be removed God. so i understand that but yeah twitter is so toxic and so mean and so biting and so shallow facebook's a little better okay so dr d-r-k-a-r-l-y-n.com yep. that's where and everybody can and that'll, have go, links and that'll to take you on there locals everything. i should probably look into getting a locals yeah i can say yeah. you up with locals I'll, I'll connect you with them yeah okay sure. i think i created a profile name but i'm so overwhelmed and i'm not i'm not a professional media marketer type person i'm just a patriot mm-hmm. out there in the trenches so um For those of you who enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Carlin, we appreciate you listening. And there are two things you can do. You can visit her website and support her. Most importantly, you can share this video or share this podcast on your social medias. And if you appreciate my efforts as Lady Maga USA and the things that I stand for and do, you can go to LadyMagaUSA.com. And uh, you can sign up to donate and you can give like a dollar or five dollars a month to uh, Lady Maga USA through um, PayPal. And so please do support this podcast. And because this is the Happy Today podcast and I, you know, I believe in happiness. My final question is today specific. What brings you the most joy? Oh, God. You know, I, I, I think there's a lot of hope in the world in terms of people seeing things as they really are. And so that brings me joy. When people, when people wake up and they see what's actually going on, they see how much the media lies to them. And even if they just have that nugget planted where they're like, there's something not quite right about that, that, that brings me a lot of joy and it brings me hope. And, you know, I think that, you know, all hope is not lost. It's like the, the arc of history bends towards justice. And we all have to keep that in mind. Oh, I love that. But I I love that. Kind of what I meant was to be happy today, like today specific from the time you woke up to when you go to bed. I want people to embrace the present moment, especially myself. So uh, tell us what brings you the most joy today in these 24 hours. Probably knitting. knitting. Is it usually knitting? And it's usually knitting. Yeah. Yeah. What does that say about you and your brain to love knitting so much that it just it's all encompassing? It seems like like making pretty things like it starts. It starts with string. It starts with literal string and then you get to make something and it's just cool. I don't know. Well, it's such a legacy that you're actually creating because we're all going to be old and we're all going to die someday. And to each of your friends who actually has one of those beautiful things, it's like I actually have my um my uh, afghan knitted by my grandmother and it's one of my greatest treasures and she made i'm the youngest of eight kids and she made one for each kid and my oldest brother was like brown and orange and then my sister was pink and purple mine was red white and blue well there you go everything happens for a reason happens for a reason all right well dr carlin god bless you for joining me today i hope to see you in person Obviously, I'm broke, so I can't really travel to all these exciting events, but I know we'll run into each other again, and you'll be wearing one of your fabulous knits, and I'll be nervous walking around as Lady Maga, and you're going to smile and hug me, and that I, <laughs> you always do that for me. So God bless you, sweetheart. I love you so much, and uh, please, please never stop speaking out. I won't, Ryan. Thank you so much. Okay. More bad news. When you're surrounded by fellow American patriots, it's a dream come true. Look to your left, look to your right. Everywhere you look, our dreams coming true. Patriots are standing for what's right.